Hey, it's time for Book by Book once again. Welcome. We've got the Bible here. I've got my Gideon's Bible here, which has gone, of course, all over the world. Have you got a Bible with you? If so, bring it out. And if you've got the study guide with you for Book by Book, that could be useful also for personal study or maybe with a group of friends. But we're doing Mark's Gospel at the moment. And I'm joined here by Paul Blacker, my colleague, and also by Rico Tice, international evangelist, and who also does a great deal of work with Christianity Explored all over the world. Rico, thank you for coming once again to be with us today. Well, it's a delight, it's a delight to be here. Absolutely wonderful. Well, Rico, what we're doing is uh, we've got Jesus here now in this passage with great crowds. He's in a boat because there's no room for him to preach on the mm. shore. He's dealing with evil spirits who are crying out, you are the son of God. And then, uh, then follows the calling of his apostles to be preachers. So let's read, I think, chapter 3, verse 11 to 14. Whenever the evil spirits saw Jesus, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Well, that's the, again the calling now of the 12 apostles. And why did Jesus actually, let me start by this, why did he silence the demons but then also send out the preachers? Well, again, you're going to hear me going back to this again and again. Mark 1 verse 1, he's the son of God. Mark 1 verse 15, therefore you repent. Now these demons, they know he's the son of God, yes, they do. but they're not going to repent. Mm. And therefore Jesus says, be silent. Don't you talk about my identity if you're not going to follow that up with the call, which is to follow me, to kneel before me. Mm. Now the preachers are going to go out. And their message is going to be Mark 1, 14, 15, the kingdom of God has come, the king has come. What do you do before the king? You kneel. So that, you know, very simple. He silences the demons because they are modeling, not obeying. But the preachers go out because they're saying, repent, obey him. And of course, the issue is, can you trust Jesus to be the one before whom you repent? Mm. You know, when you look at the life of Jesus, is this one who, whom you can trust to lead you? And of course, the answer is, well, of course, what part of his life would you reject? Exactly, there was an uh, a Indian guru years ago called Rabbi Maharaj, and that was his big problem. Can I trust Jesus to forgive me my sins? Can I come to him with confidence? That was his big decision, and he finally got to the decision. But it is a big thing. Huge. These 12 men then who are called to be preachers, mm. how far would you say they were the best and most <laughs> strategic people that Jesus could find? They're just, they're not, are they? That's the thing. He's picked up a bunch of guys, a sort of couple of fishermen and a guy who's a zealot, which probably he's a bit of a revolutionary. He, was, he may be like a, an, a, a revolutionary sort of communist or something, overthrowing the, the regime. Right next to him, he's got like Matthew, who is uh, complicit with the regime. And he's got like people, and then are these highly educated? No. Uh, I mean, Paul. A pessimist in Thomas. Yeah. Pessimist Thomas. He's like skeptical, and are they? They're not well connected. They're not part of the royal household. They're not. They, they're not movers and shakers. They're not wealthy. They're not well educated. I mean, Paul later will come, and he's a little bit better educated and things. But it's just almost as if he's like, let's keep him out of the frame for the time being. Let's have these bunch who are nobodies. Like one commentator I was reading just said, he's picked a bunch of nobodies. Why? Because in a way, it's symbolic of what this kingdom is that's for the whole world. It's all about bringing in all the nobodies. It's not about getting the elite. So Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians, he says, look around your fellowship. How many of the elite of Corinthian society are in that gathering? Not many. Not many of the sharpest and brightest buttons. This is for you don't have to have anything. You can come with nothing. And he, it's almost like symbolic, the fact that he chooses people who are not strategic. He hasn't carefully networked to get the best and no, the brightest. He's amazing. got these people. And yeah, as Rico was saying, these people authorised by him change history, change the world. These list of names, James, Peter, Simon, Andrew, Matthew, Tom, these are the most famous names in the world. People from every culture in every continent call their children by these names. At the time, who knew them? Nero. That's the most famous name. Nobody uses the name Nero now except for pets. 
<laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. And then when you get to Acts 4, the verse 13, do you remember the religious leaders when they saw the courage of Peter and John said, but surely these are unschooled ordinary men. <laughs> They're ordinary men, that's what's Yeah, brilliant. idiotes, isn't it? It's that word there. I mean, the only thing to be said for yes. them is this. They're available. They're available. The only thing is they're available. And brilliant. I do think availability huge, is huge. vastly underrated. They're there. Yep. And, um, and they follow him. Yeah, they we need, do follow him. We need to say that. But Judas Iscariot, who betrayed yep. him, it's not a great list and it it's doesn't not. end well. That great Bible end. teacher, Gordon Bridger, who yeah. we had on Book by Book, of course, he was once asked by a, an unbeliever, could you tell me a good book on philosophy, the top book? And he said, yeah, try John's Gospel. <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Jesus rejects the labels, it seems here. I mean, when we look at this, he first faces his family, who wonder whether he's out of his mind, mm. then those who say that he's possessed by an evil spirit. Yeah. But well, dealing with a family, he seems to be, verse 34 of chapter 3, a little bit rude about his family. Well, I think the theme in chapter 3 we've got to get in place, which is opposition and misunderstanding. Mm. You know, the crowds want miracles, his disciples seem a hopeless bunch. Um, the, the religious authorities in chapter 3, verse 6, want him dead. Now, that's opposition. Mm. And his family come, and, you know, it, it, it does seem rude, but the issue we've now got to get our eyes open to... He says, to, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Sounds a bit. Well, that's right. But the, the issue, the question is, are our blind eyes open to something that his family's our eyes are mm. not open to? And that is the mission of Jesus. Mm. So Jesus is coming, he's set up on his mission. Now his mother, you know, we know in Luke's gospel, his mother has a, a real idea of who he is, but she can't see his identity. She can't see at this point in time what it's gonna mean for him to pursue his mission. Mm. And therefore he has to say no to his family because otherwise he's not gonna to get to the cross. And there are points right through Mark's gospel where Jesus says no, I mean, even at the cross, why don't you come down? No, I won't. Mm. And at this point in time to his family, he says, no, now, again, uh, just yeah. to say the cults will often use these, these, uh, uh, this rejection of his family and they'll say to people, well, of course, you should reject your family and follow. And we've got to be very careful of that. But the context here mm. of opposition and misunderstanding means Jesus must head out on his mission. Nothing must stop him. His family taking charge of him is trying to stop him. And he says, no, I'm preaching. The kingdom of God's come. Don't get in the way of that. Mm. Jesus has to keep staving off or correcting people who are getting it wrong. I mean, like the, the religious leaders who are criticizing him and saying that he's uh, filled with an evil spirit. Mm. One of the things he says by way of answer, verse 29 of chapter 3, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. Yeah. What is this sin against the Holy Spirit? Oh, People yeah. worry about that, don't People they? People do worry. I tell you, the first thing that strikes, strikes me is in verse 28, he goes, I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. So he actually first gives us this incredible truth, no matter what sin or blasphemy you've committed. Because people will always say, you don't know what I've done. Yeah. The, I cannot be welcomed by the living God. Jesus' first thing he says is, all sins forgiven. And every time I read that verse, I'm staggered by the good news of it. Because people will say, no, I did this thing, murder or immorality, or I've committed things you can't imagine that cannot be. No, just Jesus, there is all sins and blasphemies will be forgiven. But then he gives this warning because they are they have misunderstood him as Rico saying they don't understand what he's doing and they're actually saying that's evil and they're resisting him and that's this theme where you there's resistance so every time the kingdom is preached the identity the reality of Jesus there is a way in which we either harden ourselves and resist that yeah. or we go we, uh, we bow the knee and repent and believe but we never leave unchanged every time that confronts us the reality the message of Jesus we go into the darkness into the hardness or into the light yeah. and into the softness. We're moths or bats, aren't we? <laughs> moths or bats, brilliant. The bats Two. fly away, the moths fly towards. Hey. What moths are you? Are brilliant. I, I love that, that into the light mm. or into the darkness. And it always happens. And he's saying to them, listen, you are resisting me. As, and we see that happening a lot. And the warning is, if you consistently do that and head into the darkness, there comes a point where that's it. God will say to you, so be it. You've hardened, it's like we see it in the life of Pharaoh in Exodus. He hardens his heart, he hardens his heart, he hardens his heart. And then God says, I harden your heart. I harden your heart. And there's no coming back from that. There's a way in which you can go so far into the darkness, you can't hear anymore and you will not, you cannot 
And, that, and it's a solemn warning to people. That way that the unbelief, 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 and I can't believe, I can't hear, I'm gone. And God's handed you over. It comes up in scripture a lot, but it's a solemn warning. Every time we're confronted with Jesus, we're, there's something happening to us into the light or into the darkness. And when people say, oh, I'll, I'll believe in Jesus when on my deathbed sometime later. Will you? It's not a good time to be sorting things out. And if you've gone into the darkness consistently, you can't, you can't come out of it. No, it's just like the end of Revelation 22. Mm -hmm. Let the filthy be filthy still. Yeah. The likelihood is that it will continue that way. Of course, we go on preaching to the end. Yes. And giving people a chance. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, there's that strong warning. Jesus then teaches in parables. Do you look at uh, chapter 4, verse yes. 1 to 34? Oh, I suppose many people have heard of this parable of the mm -hmm. sower. Actually, what would you say it's about, Rico? I mean, how is Jesus challenging us still today with this parable? Well, I think the there story. are, of course, the, the great theme is listen. Listen is the great theme. Verse 9, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. But I, I want to say two things here. I want to say, first of all, there's a, there's a, a note to preachers here that as you preach, there will be disappointment. So mm. there are going to be different types of soil. And as people hear, they're going to harden their hearts. Mm. And they'll harden their hearts. Perhaps um, Satan plucks away the word. I think that's a reference back to chapter 217, where the righteous say, you know, where Jesus says, um, it, you know, if you think you're righteous, you won't need me as the doctor. The way in which you harden your heart is by self-righteousness, saying I'm a good person. Mm. And of course, good people don't need forgiveness. Mm. But then there's, there's, um, uh, there's also, not only is there disappointment from, from that, there's, there's disappointment too from, from people who actually harden their hearts from adversity. Um, when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they, they quickly fall away. Alec Matias says there's no such thing as an untested faith. And then they might harden their hearts actually from prosperity. You know, the, the worries mm. of this world, the, 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 the deceitfulness, the, the deceitfulness of, wealth. of wealth, they can harden their hearts because of that. So as a preacher, remember there's disappointment. There's also delay. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, we read um, verse 26, 27, that the word does its work. But I, in an instant culture, delay's hard. Mm. So as a preacher, I've got to be prepared for disappointment and for delay. Disappointment in a success culture, that's hard. Mm. But also as a listener, I've got to be saying, OK, what am I doing? What type of soil am I as I hear? Is my heart hardening because of self-righteousness? Is it hardening because I'm afraid of the implication of what this word will do as it's preached in Nero's persecutions, mm. it could kill me? Mm. Is it hardening because of prosperity? Because I suddenly go, do you know, if I just turn up on Sunday, I can then just give the rest of my time to actually having a rather lovely time in this world. Mm. And all those things can cause me to harden yeah, it's as very I good. listen. Rico, it's very helpful. I mean, if there's a preacher listening who wants to preach on this, I was looking at verse 13 onwards when Jesus mm. gives the explanation to the disciples and they ask, and I think you could summarize it by saying there's the shut heart of hard, unresponsive soil. Yeah. There's the shallow heart of rocky soil, yeah. which really ends up in a flirtation only with yes. Christianity, but nothing special. It's just shallow. Or the choked heart, where the life is just cluttered up with so yeah. much to think of that you've got to never get onto the big thing. Or there's the changed heart, yes. which is receptive soil, which ends up in a crop for eternity. And maybe somebody could preach on that. Uh, actually, you see, when you think of it, Satan never gives up. He's always yeah. challenging the word. Bev Shea, the great gospel singer who died in April of 2013, he once said to his mother, or he said to his brother, his sister rather, let's test mum because she's got nothing bad to say about anybody at all in the whole world. <laughs> so they said to her, mum, what do you think of the devil? And she said, I admire his persistence. Yeah. Well, he, yeah. it does persist. Mm. Last of all, we haven't got much longer, mm. Paul, but I'm asking myself now, why did Jesus teach with these parables? Yes, it's in verse 11 there. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seen but never perceiving. And it's that fundamental issue again of which way people go, into the light or into the darkness. And he's telling these parables partly as a judgment because he, he initially came preaching the kingdom and just saying everything in normal plain language. But he's seen immediately there's people going, nah, nah, I don't want that. I'm resisting that, I'm resisting that. So he says, okay, I'm what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it all in parables. So these religious experts who are so sure of themselves, Oh, these are silly stories. We're not interested in that. We want serious stuff. 
Common people can hear these stories and understand them. They relate to it. But at all of them, you have to listen and engage and come in. Otherwise, you've just heard a little story about a farmer, a little story about mustard seeds or things like that. And he's in a, it's, in a, it's a kind of judgment to say, I am not just going to give you the, the light like that because I, you must... Because you won't listen. You won't listen. If you have ears to hear, yes, it will be given to you. I will open your eyes. I'll open your ears. And I will give you the truth. But if you won't and you back away, you've just heard a little story. It's hidden from you. Are you inside with your ears open, listening, asking to hear, or outside going away? In which case, it's hidden from you. Wow. This has been about Jesus, the teacher. But of course, that big challenge then comes to the end. What kind of listeners are we? What kind of listener are you? Because really and truly in any church, wherever there's a preacher going, preaching going on, as long as it's good preaching, the challenge is, are we going to be part of a kind of community of assent mm -hmm. where we're willing to sit under the word, not argue with it or just have a discussion. That can happen at other times. But just to take it in and listen and then obey a community of assent, providing, of course, the preacher's got something to say. So it's both listening and the kind of preaching. There was a man called William McGee of Dublin over 100 years ago who said there are three kinds of preacher. The kind of preacher you can't listen to, the kind of preacher you can listen to, and the kind of preacher you must listen to. We three are preachers. We want to be in that third category, and so do some of you who are preachers as well, to be part of the great tradition that Jesus began when he preached the kingdom. God bless you, and we'll come back for another study before too long.